from now on. Beverly Hahn. Would you close those doors, please? Yeah, thank you. That's all right. All right, morning, morning. Uh, today, we're going to continue talking about us versus them, uh, other religions, faiths, denominations, belief systems, philosophies. And today, uh, we're going to talk about um, what if people don't believe anything? Uh, today, we're going to talk about atheism and agnosticism. Um, if you had to, this is, there are no right or wrong answers. I just kind of want to poll the, poll the room. If you had to pick between two people, gun to your head, um, and you've got to share the gospel with somebody, would you rather do it with someone of different faith or someone that has no faith, and why? Yeah? Why is that? Okay, so clean slate, you'd rather have somebody with no faith. Laura? Laura? Okay, so, so the preference would be somebody that believes something because they've already in some way accepted that some things are spiritual, if you will, okay? You'd rather, you'd rather share with an atheist? Yeah, because they have a faith in nothing. Yeah, the faith in nothing, yeah. Okay. And more faith to be an atheist. The people have said that, right? It takes more faith to be an atheist, all right? Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, the, the reason why somebody is, is a non-believer is important. Uh, it could be a scientific reason. It could be because of that one church that did that one thing that one time, or that one pastor that did that one thing that one time. So, so that, that might have a lot to do with it. So we're going to look at, at how I would do this, and there's no handouts because this is going to be a complete uh, conversation-driven study. I will give you some, some information. Um, first of all, uh, the difference between when someone says they are atheist uh, versus when someone says they are agnostic. Uh, what is the difference? Atheists believe that there is no God. Atheists believe that there is no God. Agnostic acknowledges that they do not know. And it's actually, the, the, the difference is in two specific words. Atheism revolves around belief. Uh, agnosticism revolves around knowledge. Um, atheism says, I do not believe there is a God. Now, statistically, and I'm going to give you some numbers. You can write them down if you want. Um, statistically, about 90% of people who say they are atheists believe there is no God, no deity, no higher power, no guy in the sky. Um, about 10% of atheists uh, say they do not believe in a Judeo-Christian God as attributed to most religions, but maybe there is some kind of thing up there, okay? So when we talk about atheists, we're talking about people that predominantly don't believe in any deity whatsoever, but there are, there are a minority of them that will acknowledge it's nothing like what we've made it out to be, but maybe there's something up there. Uh, but it's all about what they believe in. Um, an agnostic, and understand that people ascribe labels to themselves, and they themselves might not know the definition. So we're saying this is how the words are defined. You may have someone that says, I'm an agnostic, and I believe this. Well, then you're not an agnostic. But that's, you know, we're just talking about what, what the labels mean. Um, an, agnostic, an agnostic will say that we can't know if there is a God or not. So not, it's a knowledge-based philosophy, whereas atheism is a belief-based philosophy. They're kind of interchangeable. But not all atheists are agnostics, and not all agnostics are atheists. So that's kind of how that works. Um, what percentage of the United States do you believe uh, identifies as either atheist or agnostic? Guess. We got 10%, 20%, 2%. That's ambitious. That's, <laughs> well, her name's Faith, for crying out loud. Uh, according to uh, this is 2012 research, uh, so it's a little old. Uh, 2012 uh, Pew Research says about 14% of the United States uh, identifies as atheist or agnostic. 
I know that number floats uh, a little bit, but it has actually doubled since the uh, beginning of the 20th century. So from 1900 to 2000, it's doubled. Uh, why do you think that is? Okay, the government says that we cannot have state-sanctioned prayer in school. You can pray in school all you want, but we can't have state-sanctioned prayer in school. Um, so do you think there's a connection there when, uh, when we remove God from things, uh, that it is easy to remove God from things, right? It kind of becomes a cycle, right? Okay, why else? Why, why do you think atheism has doubled in 100 years? So generational faith is what we call that. Generational faith has lapsed in the last 100 years. Um, that's a good reason. I think it's uh, merely spreading science. So science initially said certain things, and then um, atheism came along and said that science is bad. So it does weaken um, God, but it said initially before that, science said that there was faith in God. Yeah, the more, um, the more we discuss, where it, it kind of works in cycles. When people knew nothing, it was easy to look up and say, well, this is a God thing. And as people started to learn things, it's like, well, we have explanations that we don't have to include God in. Uh, so that, that kind of creates a falling away of, of a deist ideology. Um, but then, as, as he pointed out, now as we continue to find out things, some of those God gaps, which some are going to talk about, start to, start to be filled in a little bit. So uh, science has certainly helped with that. We've gotten, I mean, just recently, uh, in the past couple of weeks, you know, a couple of billionaires uh, went out into orbit, all right? Uh, they can, you know, they can view the earth in a way that, that few have before. Um, and so when you have that kind of power and that kind of influence and that kind of resource, you know. Now, as people of faith, if we got to view the earth like that, we would probably be overwhelmed with the majesty of God, right? Because like, man, I can't look at what God has done. But people without faith are like, look what we can do, right? So the more we learn, the more, the more we rely on our own resources. Um, last week I asked you, for those of you who are here, um, for those who are willing, uh, we talked about the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is uh, the, your sales pitch to somebody about something, and you have to, you have to complete it. Uh, from the time it takes to get from the bottom floor to the top floor. So it's your short pitch. And the elevator pitch is, why do you believe? All right. Now, we're not going, for a moment, we're not going to dive into Christianity. We're going to discuss uh, what would fall under the umbrella of deism or uh, being a deist. That means you don't have to be a Christian. That means a deist is someone who acknowledges a deity. Okay. So that could be a Christian, um, a Jew, a Muslim, a um, Buddhists don't acknowledge a deity. Uh, it, it could be any faith that acknowledges a deity. So we'll, we'll stay away from Jesus for just a moment. Um, but why are you? Why do you believe? And when I say why do you believe, not you know why are you a Christian? Why do you go to church? But uh, is there a God? Yes or no? The answer yes. What's your elevator pitch? What's your what's your two sentences? That, well, this is why I believe. Anybody want to share theirs, Diane? Okay, so you cannot leave creation up to randomness. It just does not reconcile in your head. Okay. Okay. So again, we're we're kind of going to scientific reasoning that this just. You know, that doesn't happen by accident, right? Okay. Well, so I believe because... Anyone have a non-scientific answer? We'll go with that. I believe because I love Jesus. He, he has made a change within me that I just, I can't, I can't deny. So the world is around self-reliance, um, but you realize that when you stopped being self-reliant is when life really changed. 
here's my elevator pitch, and it's not a good one. It's not very pastoral. Um, I believe because I absolutely refuse to live in a world that is hopeless. I may be right. I may be wrong. I think I'm right. <laughs> um, I believe that I'm right. I believe the, the, the Bible is true and everything that is said about God is true. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, I refuse to live in a world that is hopeless. And if it's all random, and if, and if, if another million years we can all grow fins out of our forehead and be a different species, uh, if when we die we're dead, um, if we never uh, can, can experience something better than this life, if we can never be reunited with, with, with people that we've lost, if we can never be in the presence of our Creator, how depressing is that? So I, I can't live in that world. I can't live in a hopeless world. Anybody else have a, have a good elevator pitch? Okay. You just, there's just, there's, you, you can't, you can't buy into the completion of the evolutionary theory. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about that because there, there's a few things you have, if you're, if you're going to be an, and we're kind of grouping atheists and agnostics in the same category. We, we know there are some differences, but, but for the purposes of, of the discussion, we'll group them in the same category. There are some things, um, if you're going to be an atheist, that you have to believe, okay? Uh, they may not even know that you have to believe this to believe what they believe, but you, you kind of have to. If there is no God, then, comma, what? Okay, you, you kind of have to subscribe. You can't, depending, there's different theories on the Big Bang Theory, there's different theories on evolution, but you have to subscribe to one of them because you can't believe in intelligent design. Right, if there is no God. So you have to believe in evolution as it is presented by most, uh, you know, by the scientific community. What else? If there is no God, then... I can do whatever I want. Who cares? I can do whatever I want. There's no, there's no moral standard. Um, now, people will say that we just have something within our humanness that creates a moral standard, but have we seen that play out well in history? <laughs> okay. So I, I have to believe in evolution if I'm an atheist. I have to believe that ultimately there may be laws, but uh, but I can do kind of whatever I want. Your um, the uh, what you're talking about there is uh, what we call moral relativism, because if there's no moral standard uh, from a spiritual standpoint, then your moral standard has to come from somewhere. And most people would say, "Well, I don't kill people because it's against the law." Okay, well, but what if I live in uh, Saudi Arabia? And where it is legal to kill a homosexual, right? Uh, so where's the where's the moral? I mean, it's it's not wrong. It's it's legal, right? Um, or certain countries where you can do uh, do this but not that, where that you can't do here. I mean, when when your moral code is relative to your culture, then you're kind of a prisoner of the culture because some things are okay to do in America that aren't okay to do over there. Some things are okay to do in Russia that aren't okay to do here. Um, you know. I mean, we can't even agree on marijuana laws from state to state, right? <laughs> so um, if your moral code is relative to your culture, um, then you're in trouble. If your moral code is relative to how you grew up, right? Well, I just, I have, my morality is based on, you know, how I was raised. Well, what if you were raised by a bunch of racists? I mean, that's just how I was raised. Can't change it, right? So yeah, so if you're an atheist, you have to believe in evolution to some extent. And you have to believe that ultimately, as long as it's not against the law, right, I can kind of do whatever I want whenever I want, which is an interesting way to live. What else do you kind of have to believe if you're an atheist? Okay, so anything spiritual, um, an afterlife, things of that nature. Uh, believe it or not, one of the other studies I was reading, I don't remember the percentage. It was a pretty low percentage. Um, there is, it's less than 10%, but I don't remember the exact number. Uh, there's a certain percentage of atheists that do believe in an afterlife. I don't know why, um, but, but, the, but the, yeah, what, yeah, exactly. Uh, but for the most part, you have to kind of acknowledge that when you're dead, you're dead. And again, that kind of goes back to my elevator pitch of like, that's so depressing. You know, um, even if I'm wrong, I'd rather be, have a little a bit of peace in this life. Um, okay, so no afterlife. No creation, no moral code. What else? Nobody 
no judgment, right? And no judgment is a pretty popular phrase in our culture right now. You, know, you can't judge me. Yeah. Uh, and that's, a, that's an interesting conversation to have. We might, we might touch on it at some point. But whenever somebody says, you know, you shouldn't judge other people, right? Uh, and especially Christianity gets a bad rap for judging other people, right? Uh, I turn it on them, and I, I go to the extreme. I'll play this card all the time because it really makes them question things. You shouldn't judge other people? No, whatever people do, that's fine. You shouldn't judge other people. You promise you shouldn't judge other people? Yeah, whatever. What about child molesters? Can I judge child molesters? Well, well, well that's different. Okay. Um, what about someone that, like, you know, uh, you know, does something heinous or terrible in some other way? Can I, you, you, would, you would probably want to judge them, right? So you don't have a problem with judging other people. You don't want to be judged for your actions. Uh, we all make judgments on people. We live in a world that is based on judgments. You evaluate information and you make a judgment on it. And the Bible never, ever, 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 if you don't take anything away from this today, the Bible never, ever, 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 ever tells you to not judge other people. Ever. Uh, Jesus tells us to make sure we use the same measuring stick. That is, don't be a hypocrite. That is, judge people to the same degree that you, you hold yourself to. That's a pretty, pretty good way to live, right? That means I can't look at you um, and you have a drinking problem, and as I sip my cocktail, I say, you know, you really should back off the sauce, right? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's what he's talking about. And then Paul uh, in Corinthians tells uh, Christians especially that when it comes to issues of morality, that the church is to actually judge each other pretty harshly. Not so much the world, but each other. Like, you know, if there's something going on in the church and it's a fellow believer, absolutely judge them. And we live in a world of judgment. We live in a world of laws. So, uh, but yeah, but the, the atheist argument, the non-believer argument is do not judge, can't judge. Anything else that is kind of wrapped into the package of atheism? So back in the day, a long time ago, um, our forefathers uh, were brilliant men. Um, regardless of what certain parties would like you to believe, they were not all Christians, okay? They just weren't. Um, but most, if not all of them, were at very least deists. They all believed in a higher power, and they all believed in a Judeo-Christian ethic. Um, and they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the, their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that is an excellent way to begin the Declaration of Independence. Uh, or actually, it's not, not how it begins, but it's in there. I um, didn't know if there's any history majors that actually know how it starts. Uh, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, for, that's how it begins. But anyway, um, here's the thing about that, though. And these were good men. These were brilliant men. They established a, a democracy that still stands today 245 years later. When they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they didn't mean it. Why? They had slaves, right? So, so even, even their own moral code, which we, we look back to the good old days, and man, we need more men like that, you know. Um, so, so they couldn't even uphold their own moral code. But somehow, over the course of time, we have translated life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness into I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, and then because if you're a good person, you'll put a little asterisk next to it and say, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, right? And that's, that's kind of the American philosophy right now is that I can do what I want, when I want, uh, as long as it is a victimless crime, you know, I can do what I want. Uh, that's what warps society's view on our resources. Uh, that's what warps society's view on uh, sexuality and gender. Uh, that's what warps society's view on everything is this idea that I can do what I want, when I want, however I want, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. Uh, so yeah, so the anything goes philosophy. So what I'd like to do for just a couple minutes is I want to look at each one of those things because, again, you are never, let me be very clear about this, uh, and, and Laura, as you, you mentioned, you're kind of close to this situation. You know this firsthand. Write this down. You are never going to win an argument with an atheist, Okay. You're just not. Um, again, going back to this Pew Research study of these statistics that I'm spouting off, they gave um, kind of a, a 
an overarching Christian survey quiz to Christians, and they gave the same quiz to atheists and agnostics, and the scores were the same. And in some instances, the non-believers scored higher. Okay, so your religious platitudes and your Ten Commandments and your Beatitudes, um, we got to hold off on that for just a minute because you're not going to win an argument. Uh, atheists and agnostics are typically people that have this high sense of logic and reason and science, and, and you, you don't go into it to win an argument, okay? Um, but for a moment, let's look at those things that we have established as this comes prepackaged with atheism. If you believe this, then you kind of have to believe that whether you think so or not. Let's look at each of those things individually and talk about how to engage because the whole idea about looking at this and studying this is how to engage, right? Um, because we do believe, and I keep going back to this even though it's kind of depressing and we don't talk about it. If someone is a non-believer, uh, I believe and this church teaches and I hope you believe, if someone is a non-believer, when they die, they will spend an eternity separated from God forever. That should shake us to our core. So this is not about winning an argument. This is about, you know, how do we engage these folks and maybe put some truth in their life? Understanding that you might, give, you might put a seed in there, you might water a seed that's already been there, You're not, you might not convert anyone, but how do we engage and start to initiate truth in these situations? That's what we're here for. So the first thing, and this is the big one, and I have a friend right now that, that I'm, I'm talking through and that just struggles with this, the idea that if you do not believe in God, if you do not believe in a higher power, if you do not believe uh, in a creator, you have to kind of accept the idea of evolution. And, for, and I, could, I could go into the big, long explanation, but the, the main theory of evolution is at some point, for some reason, in some way, there was a big bang. There was a big cataclysmic event where something was created out of nothing. And then something that was created out of nothing started to shift and change and we went from one-celled organisms to two-celled organisms to four-celled organisms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, through millions and millions and millions of years, if you've ever been to the National History Museum, you'll understand why, because they have the, the, the thing in there, and they're like, a long, long time ago. Uh, over millions and millions and millions of years, here we are, okay? Now, I believe, and, and uh, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar, uh, we did a creation study a couple years ago. It's on YouTube. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you're wired logically or scientifically, I would encourage you to go find it. It's called In the Beginning. Just scroll down through our YouTube videos a couple years. You'll see it in there. It kind of sticks out. Um, check it out. Here's, this is really important, because how many of you would say, just by show of hands, that um, as far as personality types, you're a little bit more analytical, you're a little bit more scientific, you're a little bit more of an engineer, logical, rational, scientific-minded person, okay? Now, and some of you are like, mm -hmm. um, So here's the thing, and this is important because even as believers, we have to reconcile this. You can be a believer and believe in creationism, and you don't have to let go of any of the theories that you've heard in science class or engineering class or physics class. You, you don't have to. They reconcile. They don't reconcile exactly perhaps how you've been taught, but they do reconcile. And I would encourage you to check out that study because we go into that a little bit deeper. Um, so you have to believe that, that, that all that happened in a certain way. Um, what are, just from a layman's stand perspective, if you're familiar with the Big Bang Theory, if you're familiar with evolution, what are some of the gaps uh, what are some of the things that even the scientific community says, well, we haven't figured that out yet? What are some of the gaps? Okay, fossil record, I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. So, and that, then that's important, and George touched on this at the beginning. Um, you can, atheism is a godless belief system. It is not a faithless belief system. They have faith in something, and as George pointed out, you know, sometimes it takes more faith to believe in, in what they believe, but they have faith that even though I can't point to it, even though I can't prove it, something happened, all right? So it's, uh, they, they perhaps renounce faith, but they are still in a faith belief system. 
Uh, there's the fossil record, which I'm going to touch on in a minute. What, what other kind of holes do we see in evolution? If we come from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And primates is what we're going to do. We, we, we want to be inclusive. Uh, uh, if we... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> if we could, because the, the theory of evolution is species evolved from other species, so, you know, why are the species that we allegedly evolved from still in existence? It's a, it's a, and that kind of ties into the fossil record that we'll talk about. Well, they extend life out of the ocean, right? So, uh, if evolved, if different species evolved, they evolved the same Right. So, they, they, a lot of times they apply uh, what we call adaptation as evolution. Uh, species do change over time. Breeds of, of dogs is a good example. Um, races of humanity, there are, there are reasons, uh, you know, I, I, believe in, I believe in Genesis, okay, so I believe the you know, Tower of Babel, humanity tried to do it without God, God separated humanity by languages, and I believe based on where they went, uh, their bodies became more conditioned to their environment. That's why people have darker skin, olive skin, pale skin, um, you know, my people were not in the fields, okay? <laughs> my, uh, I, uh, so I, I, adaptation is, is it, it's hard to argue with that. So they, they apply this, the, these micro changes on a, on a large scale, which doesn't always work. So the fossil record is, is probably the best um, argument against evolution, or at least evolution as it is presented. Because you take species A, and you take species Z. Species Z exists today in 2021. Species A exists in 6 million BC. All right, and that evolved from that. So what we should see, and we have fossils, right? Isn't it great that we have fossils? What we should see in the fossil record as we dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, if I dig kind of deeper, I should see species Y. And if I dig a little bit deeper, I should see species W. And if I dig a little bit deeper, I should see species M eventually to where I get to the fossil of the original species. I should see a species that slowly stops looking like that and eventually looks like this. They don't have that. Hardcore, hardline evolutionists will tell you they don't have that yet. They have this species that evolved to this species. Well, why aren't there any species in the middle? Right, so the, the fossil record is a huge, huge, huge red flag when it comes to the theory of evolution. Uh, the other thing is evolution, as, as Sean pointed out, is a, is a faith-based system. Uh, it is a speculatory system. Case in point, if you ever, how many of you are you familiar with uh, Lucy uh, at the Natural History Museum? Uh, Lucy is a skeleton that they've put together uh, of what they consider this, this primitive homo something species before, say, homo erectus or homo nematus or something. Uh, this primitive species that's kind of somewhere between primate and homo sapien. And if you look, and they even have it right there, you know, the, the bones that are, are bronzed or in gold are bones we have found and preserved, and the bones that are black are we filled in the gaps. The skeleton's almost completely black. There's like, there's like four gold bones, and they've, they've spent a little piece of a skull, and they've speculated that this is what it would look like. Now, very smart people are doing this, okay, and they're, they're speculating from a very scientific perspective, but they are speculating. I mean, they are speculating huge to the point of where when you look up evolution on the, in the internet or in any research thing, it says the evolution is the way in which human life was formed. If you look up creationism, it says the uh, faith-based pseudoscience of how some believers believe that the world was brought into being, Okay. <laughs> Now, if I'm a skeptic, let's say I'm a non-believer, I would look at the theory of evolution, and I would look at creationism, and I would have to acknowledge both theories have a faith gap, have a speculation gap, but the world doesn't acknowledge that. The world says, no, this is the way it happened. Well, yeah, I know, we haven't filled in all the gaps. We don't know about the fossil record. You know, we've built this, this human skeleton out of four bones and a piece of skull. But that's the law. And this other thing is, is pseudoscience, faith-based garbage. Um, so there's, there's a big problem in the theory of evolution. Um, so 
how do we talk about? It? Let's say let's say we're going to have a, a conversation with uh, with an atheist about just about and their their main thing they can they can love their neighbor they like the idea of church uh, you know they they really dig communion wafers they are all about everything we do but they just can't get over the scientific evolution hump where do we start that conversation? And, and, and yeah, and I can, I can go along with that. Um, now, I don't, I, I believe in, uh, as we point out, I believe in kind of adaptation and microevolution. I don't believe in evolution much at all, but I can start the conversation there. Okay, let's say things have evolved and things have changed, but you have to, do you really believe that it was just a snap of a finger, an explosion in the sky, or do you believe that somebody snapped their finger? So, so let's start with what you believe. Okay, you believe in evolution. All these things happen over and over. Let's go all the way back to the Big Bang Theory. Can you really say, you really believe that it was just nothingness into something? Or isn't it a little easier, isn't it a little bit more plausible to believe that something caused it? Okay, so just going back to something caused it is a good start. Yeah, if, if there is a design, there must be a designer. Is a is a really we've we've done the thing where we take the pieces of a, a, a simple machine, the pieces of a stapler, the pieces of a clock, something, put them in a bag, and ask them how many how for how many millions of years would you have to shake that bag until it would form into something viable, until it would form into a stapler, until it would form into a clock. Is it possible or even plausible? No, somebody has to, randomness, you don't get that with randomness, so somebody has to design it. So the need for a designer, the need for a beginning, George, do you have something different from, from that? That was, that was, yeah, so, so we start there, okay? Um, do not abandon your belief system, okay? Let, let's say that we evolved from primates. Who created primates? Well, primates evolved from, uh, you know, furry dinosaurs. Okay, well, who created dinosaurs? Well, furry dinosaurs evolved from uh, scaly dinosaurs. So what, you get them all the way back to the beginning. Don't abandon their belief system. Get them all the way back to the beginning. Something calls it. When you're dealing with people who do not have a belief system, um, and this is why I haven't pulled out any scriptures yet, I believe this Bible is true and inspired and sacred and every single thing that we need for our life. Unfortunately, with a non-believer, you can't really start here. I can get them to hear eventually, but you can't really start. Because why, why in the, well, the Bible says, let me tell you, if they don't believe in God, they probably don't believe in the Bible. All right? so you can't start here. You have to start where they are, and where they are is, this is what I believe. Okay, well, can we at least get to, you don't have to believe in Christianity, you don't have to believe in the Judeo-Christian God, but can we at least get to the point of where you believe that there was perhaps an intelligent designer in all of this? Because even a, a reasonable, rational person, the scientific community is coming along. It used to be a 90-10 split, you know, full evolution versus creationism. That 10% is getting bigger. That 90% is getting smaller. Because as Sean pointed out, the, the, the more we learn, those God gaps are starting to get filled in. So, so you start with a designer. Um, what else? Wayne. Sure. Well, here's the thing, and, and that's, a, that's, an ex, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's where the tension is created. But it's a mutual tension. And, and we, so we can't solve the problem, but we can at least, at least acknowledge it's mutual tension. And what I mean by that is, uh, we believe in a God that has no beginning, no end, that was before there was is, and, you know, and it's, that's a supernatural thing that a logical person is, uh, it's hard to wrap their mind around, right? Um, but they believe the same thing about the Big Bang Theory that we believe about God, right? So you, we, can go, we can go all the way back to God, and then we have to stop. 
well, who created God? Who, okay, fine. You, all you can do is get back to the Big Bang Theory and, you know, who, who created that. So we can't answer that question, and they can't answer ours. And so a, a lot of times it is important to acknowledge the mutual tension that, that's created, that we don't have all the answers, that there is a faith gap, there, there is a God gap. You think you call her? Okay. Yeah. So and that's and so that's where we. So if we can just land um, on this to the point of where they are no longer an atheist, but they are some okay. I don't know who he is or what he is. If we can move them into that 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 ten percent of atheists where okay, there's, there's probably something out there that has no beginning and end that, that kicked this whole thing off. It's nothing like what you were talking about. Um, it's nothing like the Judeo-Christian God, but uh, if we can get them there to where they believe that something calls something and it wasn't just nothing causing something, it's a good start. It's not perfect, but it's a good start. Um, okay, so we recognize that there's conversations that we can have about evolution. Um, my favorite verses in the Bible, um, and this is, again, when people look at things differently. Uh, I, believe, I think it was Diane that said, you know, I look at nature and there has to be a God. Like, there's no way. Uh, the Bible says, one of the Psalms uh, says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You can't look up and around uh, without God. There's something, something calls this. Um, so, we recognize there's conversations we can have about, about evolution and, and you cannot, you know, uh, make... Uh, Make non-believers accept what comes prepackaged in their belief system. I'm an atheist, but I don't believe in evolution. What? <laughs> like, that's, what do you believe in? So that comes prepackaged with you. You don't believe in intelligent design. Um, so the other thing that we talked about was the, the, the morality thing, okay? You have no, no standard of morality if you are an atheist. Uh, what's the argument there from an atheist? And we talked a little bit about moral relativism, but what's the argument from an atheist? So when you say, look, if you don't believe in God, where, where's your moral standard come from? What's their rebuttal? Okay. That's how I was raised, right? Yeah. Yeah. Old Testament God did not take any crap from anybody. We'll, we'll touch on that in just a minute. Um, so yeah, again, looking at the, the surveys, these folks that don't believe often know as much or more about the Bible than you do. And they'll even point to the Bible as, you know, it's a good, stand, it's a good moral code. They'll say, well, my moral code is the Bible. I, I don't believe the supernatural stuff, but it's not a bad way to live. Love your neighbor, help folks, golden rule type stuff. All that's good stuff, right? Um, what else? Where does their moral code come from? Karma, right? I just believe that, you know, I do good, good will eventually come back to me. If I do bad, it will eventually come around and get me. Um, you know, the Bible teaches karma, actually. We don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't call it karma, but uh, this, is a, this is a good one to throw. throw. I, love, I love having conversations with people about karma. Um, I said, oh, you're talking about the Christian principle. And they're like, what? <laughs> no, I'm talking about karma. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I believe it's 6 7. Yeah, Galatians 6 7. Uh, write this, if you don't have this one kind of committed to memory or, or know it in the back of your head, write this one down because it's, it's a wonderful conversation to have with someone about karma. Uh, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Uh, for the one who sows in his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Uh, that's the principle of karma, right? If you, if you sow in good things, you reap good things. If you sow in bad things, you, you reap in bad things. So taking someone's ideology, and we can't, we can't compromise our ideology, all right? We can't compromise our belief system, but taking what we know of their belief system and, 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 and holding it uh, against like, yeah, we actually believe that too uh, is, is a pretty good start because what we're trying to do is you're not, gonna, you're not trying to win an argument with an atheist or convert an atheist. You're trying to bring them closer to an understanding of truth, um, understanding it may be their first step, their second step, their third step. So 
So yeah, so people believe in the, their morality is based on how they were raised. They just believe in this cosmic, uh, there's no God, but I do believe in this cosmic karma, kind of you get what you uh, get what you pay for kind of thing. What else? Where does the standard of morality come from? The law, yeah. If it's against the law, I don't do it. If it's not against the law, I do it. And it's really, I, I, having a conversation about the law is, 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 is really fun with a non-believer because, um, again, people can point, and when you, when you pull things out of context, uh, and especially in the Old Testament, uh, some of it even in the New Testament, especially in the Old Testament, people can point to stories in Scripture where God decimated cities, God decimated entire, you know, men, women, children, men, livestock. He would tell his people to go in and just, just wipe them all out, you know, and that's out of context with what God was doing in the world, that's hard to reconcile. That's extremely hard to reconcile. Um, but we talk about the law and what is the source of the law. Um, we believe that God is the source of the law. Uh, force them, not force them, but, but motivate them, compel them to really take a look at history. Look at the standard that God held his people to in 3000 B.C., in 4,000 B.C., in 2,000 B.C., in 1,000 B.C., back in ancient times. And there are ancient records. There's Babylonian Chronicles. There's the Mesopotamian record. We do have secular history from those, those time periods. Look at the standard that God held his people to, even something as simple as the Ten Commandments and everything that was wrapped around it, and look at how the rest of the world worked. The standard of morality and the law has always come from God in a way that was far and away higher and a higher standard than what the world set for. The idea, why, why did the Ten Commandments have to say, thou shalt not kill? Shouldn't that just be understood that you don't go killing folks? No, because in 3000 BC, you just killed folks. You just might equaled right. If you had the biggest stick, you won. The, the, the first conflict in the Bible ended in murder, right? Cain and Abel, um, and it was, it, was, it was petty. It wasn't about a woman. I could understand that. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about stuff. Nobody had stolen anything. It was just, God likes your stuff better than my stuff. And he didn't complain. They didn't argue. He just killed him, right? So our natural proclivity as humans is not great. So why did thou shalt not kill have to be a, a, one of the Ten Commandments? Because that's what people did. Because the, the people with the biggest biggest stick and the biggest gun, or they didn't have it's the biggest arrow, won. The biggest spear won. You know, why did it say, um, you know, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? Uh, because how many of you guys have worked seven days a week, week after week, month after month after month? What's the quality of your life look like? Your health is bad. <laughs> your health is bad. Um, but that's what people did. That's why life expectancy was about 16 and a half. You know, you were an old maid at 14, and you were, you were catching out by the time you were 20. God, God established these laws, and you have to look at ancient history and look at the Mesopotamian record and the Babylonian Chronicles and the things that were going on in other time periods. God's people were held to an extraordinary standard. Um, so the moral code from God has always been counterculture, has always been different from the world. And when we look at those Old Testament stories, well, what about God? God destroyed an entire city. Um, God destroyed an entire godless city. And when we look at those cities and what they were doing in history, uh, there's a reason they were destroyed. Some of, the, some of the Old Testament laws that we don't even understand about, uh, you know, when you have a, a boil, show it to the priest, and if the hair is white, you can go home, and if the hair is brown, you got to go to the temple, and do not show me any of your rashes. I don't, wanna, I don't see that nonsense. Uh, so yeah, yeah, don't mix fabrics, you know, don't eat shellfish. All these, all these laws that we understand were for a time and for a season, it was for their safety and for their protection. Um, you know, they didn't understand uh, germs and, and sickness in the way they did, so they had, to, they had to keep people separate. And when people were living lascivious lifestyles and lifestyles that were damaging, uh, in order to preserve humanity... They had, they had to be destroyed. Now, that's, 
that's not a first date conversation with an atheist, but it's it, but you can you can get there, you know. But you have to lean into what they know. If they want to talk science and and reason and logic and history, well, let's talk about history. Let's talk about what was going on in the world. That we have a secular, non-biblical. They didn't have a dog in the record of, and let's compare it to what the Bible says, because the Bible has always established a moral code that is so far and away higher and different than than the world. So we understand there's some some flaws in the evolutionary um, logic. There's some flaws in you know where is your standard of morality? What were some of the other ones? I've, I've forgotten them now because I didn't write them down. This one's kind of tied to the moral code, the, the anything goes philosophy, right? As long as I'm not hurting anybody, I can do what I want when I want, right? What's the problem with that? Okay, big, big, big question, how do you know if you're hurting somebody? You don't always, because life is not always directly about cause and effect. Sometimes it's cause, pause, and effect. So that, that, that's, that's tied to that. And then, again, everything has exceptions. And when you start to talk about people's understanding of justice, justice is a really fun conversation to have with a, non, uh, with a non-believer. <laughs> not, not the justices, justice. Um, this idea of justice, because they say, I can do what I want, when I want, whenever I want, as long as I'm not hurting anybody. And they say, well, what about, uh, get their opinion on the death penalty, all right? Well, well, but that certainly hurts someone, generally, as a rule, uh, it kills them. Um, you know, maybe they're anti-death penalty, but, but they're not every atheist is anti-death penalty. So, so, so I can do what I want, when I want, however I want, in, up to and including something that hurts someone under the right circumstances. You know, so you start to, um, you find, you find uh, opportunities and holes in their, in their understanding um, to broaden the conversation a little bit. Everyone has very specific heels in the ground uh, kind of understanding, and you just kind of, kind of broad, well, you say that, comma, but let's talk about the exceptions to that. Let's talk about what that, what that really means. Um, so what I want when I want has some problems with it. Uh, what, about, um, what about the afterlife? In the afterlife. What do we believe about the afterlife? So if, if we're just if we're just talking in umbrella terms, uh, you know, what do we believe about the afterlife? Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Now, what constitutes a good person is different, uh, faith to faith, denomination to denomination, similar to what constitutes a bad person. But there's among deists, there's this idea that that good people receive a reward. We believe that we can only be good through Jesus Christ. That what that's what makes us Christian. But there's this this idea that good people receive a reward and bad people are punished. Um, even within deists, not all deists believe that bad people are punished. Some believe that, you know, God's kind of taking care of all that, and you might be punished for a while, or you might be annihilated, but you're not going to, like, suffer for eternity. So there are some thoughts there. But what do most atheists believe about the afterlife? If you die, you're dead. What afterlife, right? You're just, you're, you're just, you're, you're dead, you're done. Um, and again, can I prove it? You know, can I prove what happens uh, when someone dies? No. Um, but again, I would, I would appeal to just their, uh, their humanity. Again, kind of that hopeless way of living. Is that, is that really how you want to live, that when you're dead, you're dead? Um, if I believe when I'm dead, I'm dead, that really affects what I do when I'm alive. You know, if I believe when I die, there is a, a continuation of not only my legacy here on earth, but my eternity, that really... That really changes how I live. So, um, so now we're going to do a little uh, role-playing exercise. Um, I'm going to be an atheist, um, which is really tough in my profession. 
Um, I'm going to be an atheist, and I want you to give me your elevator pitches again, uh, or a different elevator pitch, but, you know, I just, I don't believe there is a higher power, I don't believe there is a God, uh, and I want you to tell me why there is, and I'm going to give you a reasonable rebuttal. All right, anybody want to step, step to the challenge? If you look at your body, you just take the eye for instance. I look at my body every morning in the mirror, and it's the glorious. You know, you're absolutely right. I'm a believer. A plus. All right. What, <laughs> the, uh, and, and again, that's, that's where a lot of us rely if there's the, 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 the design of the human body is so complex that it can't be random. Um, and that's a good place to start. Um, but people who are highly motivated by science will say that, that that's just how we evolved, that we didn't, we used to not have eyes. And so our eyes became complex because they needed to be complex. And, you know, so... Uh, no, uh you prove it. <laughs> I'll go back to how the body feels. Yeah. I dig it. Um, so, in 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 conclusion, because again, not going to win an argument. You're probably not even going to convert one. Um, one thing that we do, and and I, I think this is probably. I I believe, and and I've seen I've seen it at work, so I can say I believe with. Uh, with proof and with evidence. Something has to get you to this conversation. Okay, You are probably not going to approach an atheist or agnostic and be like, hey, today's the day you're going to believe in Jesus Christ. Um, but how we respond. Okay, uh, And this is something I talk about a lot in sermons, I talk a lot about in Bible studies, because I believe that this is the, this is the thing that gets you to this conversation. Okay, and the thing is, when something happens, a good thing, but oftentimes a bad thing, when you experience success or when you experience tragedy, how we respond, and that's why that's why being in God's word and staying prayed up and discipling ourselves is so important, so that we can respond accordingly, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. When we respond as a person who believes in God that response should be drastically different from the world, right? Can we all agree on that? Um, so, if that's true, then the opposite has to be true. When we as Christians and believers, and this is kind of the challenge point of the, of the study, uh, when we as believers respond exactly the way the world responds to success or to tragedy, oftentimes it's tragedy, but it can be success too, when we respond exactly the way a non-believer would, exactly the way the world would, why would anyone believe anything we say about faith? You know, you really need to look into this matter of faith and this matter of God because it's what it's what sustains me and I believe in and the, the higher power and the afterlife and Jesus and but then when something happens, we respond exactly how they do, we respond exactly how the world does. That kind of that kind of kills it in the water, right? I don't I don't need to look into that. Your life is no better than mine. You don't have any peace that I don't have. In fact, sometimes I feel like I have more peace because I don't you know, feel like any of this stuff is connected anyway. So your response to success and tragedy is what gets you to these conversations. The last thing, we've got, yeah, we got a couple minutes. For someone who is particularly logically, scientifically, or historically motivated, um, you know, a lot of times when we, when we talk about atheism, we've, we've done it today, we spend a lot of time talking about creation. We spend a lot of time talking about evolution, right? Because that, that, that's the big sticking point. Like, there has to be a God. Look around you, there has to be a God. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to go back with them minimum, and this is if you believe in a young earth theory, minimum six, 7,000 years. In their minds, you're going back with them 6 million years, right? 65 million years. So I don't start with creation. I'm, I don't believe in God because I don't believe in the Genesis. That doesn't even make sense to me. Okay, let's fast forward a few thousand years. Let's talk about Jesus, okay? And I said at the beginning, you know, we're not going to look at this from a Christian perspective, right? Because I wanted to get all, all that other input out of the way. But let's talk about Jesus. I believe that the strongest argument, regardless of, you know, intelligent design and look at creation and morality and everything around us, 
I believe the strongest argument for uh, a creator God, for the the Judeo-Christian understanding of God as we believe in him, does not lie in Genesis, it actually lies in Jesus. And here's why. Start there. Uh, Because even the most skeptical scholar acknowledges that the, the, the historical figure of Jesus uh, there, there are not many scholars that don't believe he did not in some way at least exist. Secular scholars, people that didn't have a dog in the fight. Jesus existed. Okay, so we know there was a man, a carpenter from Galilee, named Jesus of Nazareth, that existed. We also know a lot of stuff has been written about him. Okay, now you might not believe this stuff that was written about him. We'll get there eventually. So let's look at the other stuff that was written about him. Okay, let's look at pagan Roman uh, writers that recorded history that couldn't care less if you believe in God or not because they didn't believe in God. In fact, they believed in gods. So they, I'll, I'll admit, the Bible's written with an agenda. The Bible is written to get you to believe in God through Jesus Christ. There's an agenda in this book. Uh, historical, a lot of the historical first century writings, they don't have that agenda. They're just writing, hey, here's what happened and here's what people were saying. So let's look at there first. We can agree that Jesus existed, and we can agree that a lot of stuff was written about him, and it wasn't written no matter that this is a fallacy, and make them prove it. If they say, well, you know, those stories were made up thousands of years, or hundreds of years later, or a thousand years later, make them prove that that is not true, okay? These are ancient writings that we can verify, and we can look up, and we can point to. Um, Start with Jesus. He existed, okay? You don't have to believe he was the Son of God, but he did exist, People have written a lot of stuff about him. Much of what was written about him in secular history matches biblical history. Okay? So let's not, let's not start with Genesis. Let's start with Luke. Okay? Because I can, I can tell you who Luke was. We know who he was. He's quoted in secular history. He was a scholar. He was a doctor. Um, and he wrote an account of the life of Jesus by talking to what he says, uh, eyewitness or whatever. You don't have to believe it's the inspired word of God yet. Let's just look at the account of this scholar named Luke that wrote about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's see how the biblical account uh, reconciles with the historical account. Let's start with Jesus, because Jesus was not 6,000 or 65 million years ago. Jesus was 2,000 years ago. And Jesus' followers extended into, uh, the great thing about uh, the historical record is the Apostle John uh, lived to be an old man. Uh, He he did not pass away until 90 or 100 uh, AD, give or take, which means the people that studied under John actually lived well into the second century. We call those the the, the first generation fathers, Uh, men like Ignatius, you might see that name in church history, and uh, Polycarp and, and men like that extended into the, the second uh, century. And so the records we have of Jesus, both the kind of the spiritual records and also the historical records, the people that wrote them are not B.C., Mesopotamian, you know, spear chucking, you know, an ancient civilization we can't even wrap our mind around. They start to, I mean, it's still a long time ago, but it starts to drift into a part of history that is at least accessible. Right? So, I believe everything we said about creation. I believe in all the fallacies of evolution. I believe in, in trying to wrap our mind around this, 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 uh, this morality code and how uh, you, you, know, you have to have a, you have to believe in God to have a, a sense of morality. But I believe that the takeaway uh, to start this conversation is to start with Jesus. You can get to Jesus a, a lot quicker than you can get to Genesis. As we start to see what was written about him, what he said about himself, what other people said about him, uh, then we can then we can use that to point to God. You can use God to point to Jesus, but you can also use Jesus to point to God. Um, and again, you're not trying to you're not trying to convert anyone. You're just trying to give them enough information or put enough questions in their mind. I just want to put questions in their mind. Put enough questions in their mind and say, you know what? It's worth looking into. You know what, it's, it's, worth, it's worth watching a video, it's worth reading a book, it's worth taking a study. And you have no idea what those little seeds that you've planted uh, will do. Uh, last, certainly not least, and this is 
why I asked you all to do your elevator pitch because we need to get really good at this. Um, your personal story has more impact than you know. The reason God has brought you through certain things is so that your story will have an impact on someone that it wouldn't have on someone else. Start with the Bible, start with Genesis, start with all these logical arguments we can have, but do not abandon your personal story because you've experienced what you've experienced for someone else. Uh, as George mentioned at the beginning, why do I believe? Because my life is so drastically different. You know, start, start with your story. Uh, get comfortable talking about your story. Share your story with a believer just, just to get comfortable doing it. You know, no, that, that way they're, they're not going to disagree with you. They're not going to throw you under the bus. Just talk to other, that's what, we, that's what we do, right? Talk to other believers to get good at sharing your story because your personal story will have an impact on someone closest to you more so than some of this other stuff. Gave you a lot of bunch of, whole lot of information. Um, I hope that you will, I hope that you'll talk to an atheist this week. I, I really do. I think it'd be awesome. Um, next week, we're going to look at uh, the, the thing that birthed Christianity, Judaism. Uh, there is uh, Orthodox Judaism, which they're still, you know, sacrificing stuff. There's, uh, and then there is uh, Contemporary Judaism, uh, which is Cultural Judaism, uh, and they're drastically different. Uh, they have a lot of, they, they believe they believe half of what we believe, uh, you know, all the way up to Malachi. So uh, it's uh, important to know kind of the foundation of our own faith, what, Ju what Judaism is, how it led us to Christianity, and why Jews uh, still believe the way they believe and, and they, they have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, you know anyone who is Jewish or Jewish, um, like they're culturally Jewish? Um, I would encourage you this week, uh, ask them some questions. Why don't they sacrifice stuff anymore? Um, you know, what are their opinions on Jesus? Uh, that that it, it spreads across uh, across a lot of different. You know, some of them believe he was just misguided, misunderstood. Some believe he was out of his mind, crazy. Some of them believe he was a false prophet. Um, find out find out their opinion is on sacrifices and Jesus. If you know any Jewish people, it will help in the conversation next week. All right, let's pray and we'll have church again. God, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, thank you for the knowledge of who you are. May we live our lives in a way that recognizes who you are and allows other people to recognize who you are. God, may we stay in your word and, and may we be learned so that we can have these difficult conversations, not, not to win an argument, but God, we, we believe you are the source of truth, you are the source of right, you are the source of love, and we want other people to know that as well. Lead and, and direct us in these conversations. Create opportunities. Force us to have uncomfortable conversations. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.